Welcome to our new class on Model I. Uh, I hope you hear me, but probably you don't see me. Uh, yes, we hear you, but don't see you. So uh, no, let me. Now you see me. No, is it okay? Yes, and I yes. see I see Machia, and hello everybody. Uh, you are very. Uh, I'm very happy that you are still with me and that I'm not alone. So we had a, a four weeks break, <coughs> and uh, probably it will be the last lecture today. But you know, in mathematics, you always have new, <laughs> new things to tell and to discuss. But I think after today, I will stop at least for a while, and. Uh, the case of point in the plane will be postponed until we know more about it. In fall, I plan or I think of doing another light board lecture online, international, but on a different topic on Fuchsian differential equations, algebraic. So it will be called Algebra Meets Analysis and Number Theory. So it will be a combination of <coughs> these three fields using algebraic methods to study differential equations. So I have already done a course on this one year ago, but meanwhile we understand much more, and so I will inform you in due time whether this course will take place. It also depends whether we still have the light room. It seems that the library here wants to take this room for other purposes, and then we have the light board but no room, and that would not work. We will be in contact. So for today, we have a kind of closing ceremony. And uh, the topic will be, as I already announced, the recovery of endpointed stable curves from strings of n-gons. In P1 uh, to the n. So <clears throat> recall that Delin and Mumford defined n pointed stable curves as a union of P1s, so if you take genus 0, with some points on them and certain combinatorial properties. And this was kind of a not only a surprise, but a, a big discovery because they allowed. This definition allowed them to compactify the space of n-gons of n pairwise distinct points. Yeah? So it was a new concept of limit where you, when you take n points in P1, it's not that you just allow to come points together, but in the limit, you also deform your P1 to a union of P1s. Okay? That's something you cannot deduce. You have to have the intuition. Yeah, to take not just the limit of your object, but even the limit of the space where the objects live. Okay, So of course, <coughs> let me draw an endpointed stable curve, just to recall. So we draw the p1s like this, and uh, maybe like this, and then we had these extra points on components whenever you needed more. Okay. So <clears throat> what I want to tell you today, and of course we are not going to give complete proofs, but I want to show you that the machine works, the machine of phylogenetic trees and geometric combinatorics, to construct or to discover these stable curves just by using strings, yeah? so without talking about limits and anything else. So <clears throat> now as we have had a big, a, a long break, you may have forgotten uh, some of the notation. I have to recall again. So Yn was the space of strings of n-gons with 
same cross ratios, the elements were written x equals xt, t triples n, n was the set of labels, okay, and xt was an n gone in p1 to the n. We allow components of xt to be equal, but only up to a certain degree. xt always has at least three different components. So if t is i, j, k, xt i, you are already familiar with this, xt j is 1, and xt k is infinity. So this is kind of a <clears throat> installment of these n-gons. And then we have the projection map We take yn plus 1 with labels n prime equals n union, an extra label a. And uh, we go pi a from yn plus 1 to yn. And this is just forgetting all entries involving A. I don't uh, <coughs> specify the details again. You can look it up in the notes or in the, in the recordings. By the way, I had to use uh, our website for a workshop which takes place in two weeks in Lisbon, which I'm organizing. And, uh, I will reinstall our website afterwards so you can, if you want to look up some details, you can look it up there. By the way, I have sent you a part one of a manuscript of the lecture notes of this class. Part two is still work in progress. I want to do it, but we learned, it turned out that it is more work than expected, so it will take a little bit of time, but I have your email addresses and I can send it to you whenever it is ready. Okay. So <clears throat> we take choose x in y n below with fiber. I call it f of x pi a inverse of x inside y n plus 1. And, uh, then as we have x, we have gamma for x, the incidence graph, or if you want the phylogenetic tree of x. And uh, I have to draw it briefly again, just a simple one, uh, in order So the blue part, I call it the skeleton of gamma of x. And then we have the leaves, which I draw in red, which constitute the entire phylogenetic tree. Skeleton is just the blue part. So <clears throat> Uh, we have this projection map, and then we will define n sections, sigma i of pi a. So sigma i will go from uh, y n to y n plus 1. If you compose with pi a, you get the identity. This means being a section, and they are disjoint, uh, which means that if you take sigma i of x, if you go upwards, this will pick, will pick 
a point in the fiber. And for i different j, this will be disjoint. Sigma i x is different, sigma j x for i different j. And i goes from 1 to n. So what does this mean? We get n points on the fiber fx, on the components. Yeah? So maybe I, I draw them to distinguish them in blue, but actually they will be these red points. Yeah? So maybe I should not yeah, I draw them. These will be selected by our sections. Now, of course, the colors don't correspond. These red points correspond precisely to the labels we have here. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> what do we want to prove? Yeah. Uh, we now get a fiber f of x with n points on it, and we expect, and we will try to motivate that this is true. I cannot give the full proof. We expect that this will be. Uh, an endpointed stable curve. So f of x has dual graph equal to the skeleton of gamma of x. So what does this mean? This means that for each in a vertex, we will get a component, A. Every inner vertex, V of gamma of x, corresponds to a component, let me call it CV of f of, f of x. Uh, recall, our fiber is a union of p1s, and each p1 will be a component. And we will associate to each of these vertices precisely one component. And the intersection pattern is given by the adjacency in the graph. So two components, CV and C, W intersect if and only if V and W are adjacent in gamma of x. Can you still read this? Yes, I hope it works. Adjacency just meaning they are connected by an edge. So here you would have here you would have V and here you would have W. Okay. Now, the statement is so precise that either it's completely foolish and nonsense and does not work, but if, it is, if there is some sense to it, it must be true. Yeah? So that's a situation which is a very special one in mathematics. You are completely convinced that a statement is true. You just have to prove it. In many conjectures, you don't even know if the conjecture could be true or not. It could be also the opposite, or you may have a counterexample. But here, it is so detailed and so apparent that you are 100% or 120% sure that it will be OK. And then <clears throat> the, the third property, C, which I don't know where to write, I don't want to erase. So maybe I can squeeze it in here, Ex apologize, C. So this was part one, and this is now part two, and we call it C. The, the endpoints we have, though sigma i of x belongs to a certain component Cv, if and only if 
Now i runs from n1 to n, which means it runs over the set of labels. So i will be here a leaf of v. i is a leaf of v, which I also called a singleton. So we have a very precise description of the fiber. And of course, a, b, c are just the definition of an endpointed stable curve. Because by the property of a phylogenetic tree of having no vertex, no inner vertex of degree 2, we get precisely the conditions on the endpoint at stable curve, which I don't recall now. Okay? Everything fine so far? Is this clear? Any questions from your side? So I always have to move a little bit my head because I don't really see through, through my handwriting. So I have to, to find a, a spot where I can see the camera. Okay. So I erase everything, and you can uh, remember a little bit uh, all these definitions and properties. So of course, I am not able to, to prove this in detail, because it would be just too much writing. But what I can do is <coughs> I can tell you the story which is behind. Uh, so that at least you will believe that it is true and that there is a proof. So <clears throat> the proof is its not difficult, but you have to take some care. So strategy of proof. So the strategy in philosophical terms is be well organized and actually be very well organized. So if you are very well organized, then the proof is more or less straightforward. And being very well organized uses the second thing, which I already uh, claimed several times. This organization comes from a detailed understanding of phylogenetic trees. So if you look carefully at your tree, and if you look carefully at the statements you want to prove, then you will see that you just have to read this book of combinatorics to carry out the steps you need. So <clears throat> let me recall the equations now for this fiber are given by. Now I assume some of the things I already explained a long time ago. So you might not remember them, but please believe them now are given by equality of cross ratios, which are the form the cross ratio with respect to a quadruple Q. Now here we have x, s, and then we have the free variable y, s, a equal 
to the cross ratio q x t y t a, where x is of course x t t in n two three. So these here, the x is s and x t are constants. I did this already several times, and the y is the variable. So <coughs> s, t are in n two three, and q is a quadruple in n four. So we have many variables. We have n two three variables. N two three variables, and uh, in order to to prove that the solution set is a curve, we need at least n to 3 minus 1 equations. We need n to 3 minus 1. Let me call them significant equations. <clears throat> now the variables are given y, t, a. Now, if you count here the number of equations, you have many more equations. So what we will do is we will pick out of these many equations n to 3 minus 1 distinguished equations, and these will give us the curve. And then the other equations will be shown to be redundant. Okay? We explained this already quite a while ago. Yeah. And how do we do this? We use the adjacency of triples, use adjacency of triples, and adjacency of triples means that of the three entries, two are equal. Yeah. Two equal entry. So typically we would have s equals i, j, k, and t would be i, j, l. And there was an exercise showing that there is always a, a counting of triples. You can order them so that you only have adjacent consecutive triples. We never did this, but uh, I hope you believe that it works. It's not very, very difficult. OK. So <clears throat> what we will do, uh, we will choose n to 3 minus 1 pairs of adjacent triples. Okay, So we order these triples. We have n to 3 of them. And then we only take adjacent pairs. So we have precisely n to 3 minus 1 pairs of adjacent triples using a total ordering of n to 3. Uh, with adjacent, I don't know how to call it, how, with adjacent successors. Yeah. And for each such pair, st, a unique quadruple. Q, which is Q depending on ST. And then if you call this equation here ESTQ, then we will get N23 minus 1 equations ESTQ 
qst cross q xs ysa equals so st cross qst xt yta. So what we will do, we will show that these distinguished equations define a stable curve. Distinguished equation define a stable curve. Actually, it will be equal to the fiber, but let me call it for the moment maybe g of x with dual graph the skeleton of gamma of x. So this is one thing we have to prove. And the second thing is that the remaining equations are multiples of these equations. The remaining equations. are multiples, constant multiples, not just linear combinations, but they are just multiplying both sides with the same constant, are constant multiples of the distinguished ones. And I think I will not prove this. That's, it's not very, it's not very difficult, but it's not very exciting as well. It's a small computation. But the first part is nice to show. The first part is actually very nice to show, and I try to transmit this to you. So <clears throat> I think I have to erase something. So how do we, how do we choose these pairs of triples? So the choice of pairs of triples S T. That's actually the point where you have to be very careful. And uh, let me draw again our favorite phylogenetic tree. Maybe, maybe I even allow you three. So recall the concept of meeting point. So if we have a vertex v here, v, then v, the vertices were defined as the orbits of n-gons. So <coughs> all right, v would be the xs orbit of some n-gon xs, but of course, Many n-gons may define the same orbit. Okay, so it could also be for another triple t, s t in n two three. So how do these s and t look like? Now, 
if you have here uh, maybe i, j, and k, then we had the concept of meeting point. Meeting point was the vertex where the paths from i, j, and k meet. And in our situation, the meeting point of i, j, and k will be precisely this vertex, yeah? because you see, you have three paths to i, j, k. So in order to check whether xs has an orbit which defines this vertex, you just have to check whether v is the meeting point of s. So this is equivalent to v is the meeting point of s, which means of the three entries of s, let's say s, i, j, k. But of course, you could also choose a, a quite different, maybe I write them in green, you could also choose maybe i prime, you could choose j prime here and k prime here, and then you would have t equals i prime, j prime, k prime, which works as well. Okay. So now we we draw this again. I just draw the skeleton. You see, it's very elementary, just combinatorics, not even combinatorics, just fooling around with these graphs. V, W. And now I make a different drawing. I denote by P of V S in n choose 3, v is the meeting point of s. So we collect for each vertex the triples which define it. Okay, So this is again s in n choose 3, v is the orbit of xs. And now I have to, I want to draw these sets of triples. I want to associate this to V. And I draw it like a kind of circle. Let me draw it like this. Now, this is maybe a little bit confusing. This almost circle with the dots on it will represent the triples s defining v as meeting points. So let me write here s. And we do this for each, each vertex. I draw it like this. We get some triples defining it. Okay. These are the sets pv. And now our counting and now our counting of the triples goes as follows. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to explain, but PV can be ordered so that neighbors will be adjacent. Order each PV such that Neighbors. Uh, neighbors means they are in the ordering successors of each other, that neighbors are adjacent triples. So here in this picture, you could make the ordering like this, maybe, by putting an orientation on these almost circles. So now <clears throat> you, go, you go on like this. You start 
with the accounting of all triples, you start here. You go to the next one, next one, until you end up at the last. And then you go over here. You start with the smallest one, go around, end up here, and then you go to the next. Yeah? So you do a turn here, jump to the next one, turn, jump, and so on. Of course, when you are here, you have to jump to this one. And later on, you will also have to jump to this one in red. But that's not a, that's technically maybe a confusing, but that's not a problem. OK. So repeat, we order each of these uh, circles, and then we connect them by adjacent uh, triples, yeah. this one with this one. So maybe I could draw here to visualize. We continue with this and here, and from here we go we go here, but we also go here. Okay. I hope you you can follow my argument. Yeah? And then then choose for each edge. a pair of adjacent triples. Of course, you have to perform this in detail, but it's not very difficult. Okay. So in this way, we get our n to 3 minus 1 pairs of adjacent triples. And then we are almost done. I will show you how we choose our QST. Yeah. So we have two, two cases to distinguish. So this adjacency of triples has a reason. Yeah. Everything relies on choosing these adjacent triples, because when you have adjacent triples, you can use the triple product formula. Yeah, maybe I should write this down as a remark. A remark, a decency of triples <coughs> as t is necessary to apply the triple product formula for cross ratios. So <coughs> if we have s equals i j k and t equals i j l, which means that they are adjacent, then if we take, for instance, q as t i j k a, yeah, then we can also, and we would take q t s equals i j l a, then if we <coughs> If we take these five labels, i, j, k, l, a, then we can look at q tilde equals i, j, k, l. And then we have five labels, and this, these together will give us the triple product formula. Where the cross ratio with respect to i, j, k, l is a constant because it does not involve y, t, a. Yeah, so cross q tilde x, s, y, s, a is a constant. And this is a clue for everything. Okay. So let us, let us carry out this program. So where am I?
So let me now look at the equation. Let us look at the equations E s t, q s t. I will define q s t in a moment. This was just for the remark. Look at the equations E s t for our chosen adjacent triples s t. Now we have to distinguish two cases. Case 1, both s and t belong to the same PV. So they are in one of these semicircles, quasi-circles, same v, same vertex. So we already computed the equation. We take, I think I take, ah, I'm cheating a little bit. I had a, I should have taken here k and here l. I'm sorry for this. I hope you can correct this. <laughs> Otherwise, it does not agree with my, here we take L and here we take K. It doesn't matter. It's up to symmetry. So the case <coughs> A is if they belong to the same. And then we take Q as T as above. I, J, L, A. It also works with I, J, K, A but because it's symmetric, but let's take it like this. And then we get E, S, T. We did this computation already. I just write it down. Y, S, A, Y, T, A minus 1 equals X, S, L times Y, T, A minus Y, S, A. So we have two variables, ysa and yta, and we have this is a constant, this xsl, which depends on our string x. This is constant. OK. So <clears throat> we have already looked at this equation, and this is singular or is smooth hypersurface if and only if xsl is different from 0 and 1. We did this computation already. Okay. So when we have s and t in the same, for the same vertex, I claim that this here, this equation, is actually a smooth hypersurface. So xsl is different from 0 and 1. And if this is the case, then we can express yta as a function of ysa, yeah? because we just solve for yta. And as it is smooth, we can do this. So this allows us to eliminate all these yta and to get from these equations just one free variable, namely one of these uh, triples here. Okay. So why is this the case? I think I have to I have to make a new picture. I think I can erase here. I want to do a couple of pictures because this is maybe more amusing. So we know already what we expect, and we just have to check it up in the phylogenetic tree. And of course, <laughs> it will be OK. So now I make a, a kind of different drawing to show how this works. Let us take uh, the following tree. Uh, 
it's just, of course, an example, but it works in general. We take one with a degree 5 vertex v here. v would be xs equals xt. We take, I will show you three different triples. Here we have a vertex, maybe w. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And then we will have a couple of leaves here, 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 here. Then let me take here three and here two, and then here. And let me distribute i, j, k, l, and l prime like this. And let us take, so of course, if we take s equals i, j, k, whereas i, j, k, the meeting point will be v. So that's OK. If we take t equals i, j, l, we have i, j, and l. The meeting point is again v. So that's also OK. And if we take t prime i, j, l prime, then we have i, j, and l prime. Meeting point is again v. So we have this equality here. Yeah? Now in each case, let us determine uh, xsl and xsl prime. Okay. So we, we compare these here. And what do we get? <coughs> uh, xsl equal. So maybe you can do it on your own. And afterwards, we want to do xsl prime equal. So the situation will be slightly different. Now we know our rule xsl. So we are in this vertex, and everything which is here, the labels which are here, signify that the entry of xs with these labels are equal. Yeah? This is our incidence graph. I repeat, if we have a vertex here, it is the orbit of xs, s is a triple, then the entries of xs, the components of xs, with labels corresponding to these leaves are all equal. So xsl here will be the same as xsk, no? because they are on the same destination. So this equals xsk. And what is xsk? s is ijk, so this is infinity which is, of course, different from 0 and 1, as we wanted it here. Now assume that we have taken a different, we have taken L prime. What's going on with L prime? L prime, now xs L prime, uh, let me check. It is different from xs L, different from this one and different from this one, so it is in particular, different xsi, xsj. But xsi, as i is ijk, is 0. And this one is 1. So this implies that xs l prime is different 0, 1 again. Okay. So it is just a case distinction according to the possible distribution of your labels of your triples. So this implies, so this holds true. So uh, it's not a claim, it's a fact. In this case, HST, which is the hypersurface defined by this, is smooth and allows us to eliminate all variables yta
for t in PV except one. Okay, that's the only free variable at the end. So <clears throat> we do this for every vertex. So we have here for v, we will have just one free variable. And again, for w, we will just have one v free variable. And we choose them so that the triples s and t are adjacent. So now we have to show that some intersection occurs. So this is the second part, case b. I think I can erase everything. Do you want to have a short break, maybe? What's the time? It is uh, 10 to 5. Yeah, let's have a, a five minutes break, and then we continue, OK? Just to take some water and
Okay, I'm back, back again. So we will continue for some 20 minutes, maybe not too much time. <clears throat> so now comes the case where we have chosen for each vertex a selected triple S already. So this is case B. We have S in PV, T in PW. So they are in different ones. We have two different uh, vertices, but they are adjacent. Adjacent vertices. And we want to show that the two components show that C, V, and C, W intersect. But we already have computed <coughs> the equation uh, from last time. We had this equation E S T Q S T. <coughs> so again, we take Q S T equals I J L A. That's the trick of this choice. And then we have seen that the X S L actually is 1. So the equation is singular, and it will read like this, yta, ysa minus 1 equals 0. Now, s will correspond to v, t will correspond to w. So we could substitute the variables yta and ysa by the vertices themselves. So we could write here, this one will correspond to w v minus 1 equals 0. So now v and w are the variables. No? It doesn't matter if we call them yta or associate them to the vertices directly. Okay. So we have this type of equation. And now let us check what happens if we take all of them. So as I have to write a bit, I want to do it in the case n equals 5. Example, n equals 5, because here you already see how it works. No? And the general case is more to write, but the same pattern. So n equals 5. The gra the Phylogenetic tree is very simple. And to, to emphasize even more, I will now consider three vertices. And I take v and w not adjacent. This is my notation. But v and u is adjacent, and u and v, w. So this does not precisely correspond to this here. And how are the, is the distribution of the, of the leaves? We have one leaf here, two leaves here. And I will give them a name in a certain order to be well organized. I, J, K, L, M. And uh, I will associate triples. The V will be, <coughs> I should write it here. This will be some xs, orbit of xs. W will be, I think I call it xt. And the, in the middle is xr. And how do these triples look like? S will be, so S is the meeting point. You need i, k, and you could choose j, so we take S equals I, J, K. The ordering here plays a, a role. One has to be attentive, but I don't I skip these details. T, I, J, L, and R will be I, J, M. So now the situation is subtle because 
you want to show that now we have three components. Huh? We have Cv, Cu, Cw. And each of them is a P1, or isomorphic to a P1. And what we want to show is that Cv and Cu intersect, that Cu and Cw intersect, but that Cv and Cw do not intersect. So we expect uh, C U C C V intersected C W non-empty, C U intersected C W non-empty, and C V intersected CW empty. Yeah. This just means that the dual graph has, is a skeleton of this. Implies dual graph equals skeleton of gamma of x. Yeah. That's the rule for the dual graph. And of course, uh, you see this. You look here. So I was I made a lot of mistakes in the choice of these triples. So it did not come out properly at the beginning, but then I realized that I was not very systematic. So now here it is very systematic, and I give you now the equations. So whenever we have an adjacency of two vertices, we will get an equation. So I just write it E, V, U. I replace now S and T by V and U. We will get an equation E, U, W. And we will get an equation V, W. Okay. And I, we have three variables, V, U, and W. So we are in p1 to the power 3. And what we want to have is we want to have three curves with these properties. Okay, So we have three equations here. So as we expect a curve, we should have two equations. So what we will see is that this last equation is just the sum of these two, so this one will be redundant. Will be redundant. So we have just two equations in three variables, which defines a curve, if everything is OK. And then we have to show, to show that the intersection pattern is correct. But we have computed here our equations. This is now u times v minus 1 is 0. This one is w. u minus 1 is 0. So you see, it's very simple. And uh, this one would be w v minus 1 is 0, by the same rule as above. And this depends, of course, on the choice of this quadruple. Okay. But this one follows from these two you just multiply this one. What do you have to do? Uh, e v w is w times e v u minus v minus one e u w. So that's why it is redundant. Okay. So that's easy. You check this immediately. So now we have, we can forget about this part here. And now we are really down to the most simple algebraic geometry, two equations in three variables. And what do we get? Now we solve this. Let me call it star. Solving star, we just make a case distinction. 
first case u is 0. If u is 0, then uh, here we have non zero, then w must be 0. And uh, v is free. So our c v will be 0 v 0. So it is this line, which is 0 times p1 times 0. Next case, if u is uh, 1, symmetric, then v is 1 and w is free. And we get cw equals 1, 1, w. So now here, this is, of course, a parameter, uh, which you could also write equal 1 times 1 times p1. So it is a translated coordinate axis. And the third case, it works out. If u is different from 0 and 1, then we necessarily have that v and w must be 0. v equals 0, w equals uh, v equals 1, sorry. v equals 1, w equals 0. So c u is u 1, 0, which you could write as p1 times 1 times 0. You agree? Hmm? So these are the three components. And uh, now you compute the intersection points. And you get precisely what you want. And I think that already this simple computation convinces you that the general case is not really more difficult. You just have to write more. But so <clears throat> these intersection points, intersections, we get CV intersected CW. Let us check. CV is 0, is 0 times P1 times 0, but CW is 1, 1, W. So these are empty. CV intersected CU. If you intersect these two here, you have to take U equals 0. So we get the point 0, 1, 0. And if you take CU intersected CW, you get the point 1, 1, 0. Isn't this fantastic? Huh? You just compute from your complicated equations, and you get precisely what you want. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I have here a more complicated example uh, where you can exercise, maybe. Example exercise. So you can try it on your own. We take n equals 6 and a graph which is called Riebisel. I don't know. Cranberry in English, maybe? Riebisel is a, a berry. Yeah, the name is from Josef Schicho. And uh, it looks like this. We, the skeleton, now we have four inner vertices, which I call v equals xs, u equals xr, w equals xt, and z equals xp, I think. You can do it on your own. Now we have 
In each case, we have two two leaves, and so this the, the names of the leaves plays an important role because you have to be very symmetric. Otherwise, you will be completely lost with your equations. Uh, M and up. I miss, I need a more, let me call it n because n, this one n is already fixed. So let me do it with this one. And you take <coughs> s is again i j k, t is i j l, r is i j m, and p is i n m. So the double notation of n should not bother you. And then we get now three equations, e, v, u, u, v minus 1 equals 0. Very simple equations. e, u, w, w, u minus 1 equals 0. And e, z, u, u, z minus 1 equals 0. And you get again precisely what you want. So I can draw maybe the. We have four components, and it should be like this. So this should be C U, C V, C W, and C Z. Okay, and then the last part of today will be to define on this. This is now f of x our fiber. And what is missing is are the endpoints. No? And uh, for this, you define sections, and this will be the end. To pick. <coughs> Endpoints on this fiber uh, will depend on our string x. And uh, of course, the choice of these endpoints here should be continuous or even polynomial in the string x. So we need a general rule to associate to a point to a string below points above. And this is done by sections. So this is the last part. Sections of chi A. So i equals 1 to n. Now my n is again the usual n. We take x in yn, why do I? Yeah, I don't want. I don't want to call it i. I want to call it l. Sorry, this should be an l for reasons which hopefully become clear. So we now define sigma l from yn to yn plus 1 sections of pi a, which means going backwards. I recall that this means pi a composed with sigma l is the identity on yn. And we want to do this in a way that sigma l of x is different from sigma l prime of x for all L different and prime. So this is called disjoint sections. Okay. Now, how do we do this? Uh, x, which is below, is a string of n gons, t in n to 3. And now we have to associate to it, now this will be here sigma l, something which I call y 
but it will depend on L. I don't know where to write this L. I write it here. And you define it as follows. It will be, again, I own, yeah, I, you take xt and you add one component y t a for t. It suffices to define this in what we called, I think we called it, I think, in f tilde of x. So I don't need to define the n-gons where t involves the label a. Okay. And how do you do it? By setting. You don't have too much choice. Y t a equals x t l. Okay. And then you have to prove that this works out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which I'm not going to do, uh, but you can do this for every L. This defines n distinct points on fx on this fiber remains to show that sigma l x is sitting. Now, where does it have to sit? It has to sit precisely where the label indicates. No? So sigma l has to sit in the component corresponding to the vertex where the label is sitting. It's sitting in the component let me call it CV of f of x. For the vertex V of gamma of x to which L is attached, the label L is attached remains to show, and this is homework for you. So that's all for today, and that's also the point where I want to close my course. I'm very pleased by your interest and cooperation. I hope that you had, uh, had some fun, that you learned some things, that you may even start to think about this problem. As I said already several times, the case of points in the plane is more complicated because you have to treat collinearity. But here, at least you see that everything works fine, even though, of course, I did not give the complete proofs. I only gave you the idea how the proofs would work. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful springtime. And I hope that we meet again in the future. Bye-bye. Thanks. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.